tripping Yeah, she's on a mission Keeping our culture lifted Now you can watch and listen It's Tammy Mac, Tammy Mac Oh, what show was that? It's the Tammy Mac Show on Fox So, hey Tammy Mac, hey, Tammy Mac Yeah, who that? Tammy Mac, Tammy Mac Hey, so you know it's Tammy Mac Welcome to the Tammy Mac Late Show on Fox Soul. I am Tammy Mac. So tonight we're talking about the new bill that would allow Supreme Court proceedings to be televised. Why a man was arrested outside Vice President Kamala Harris's house. Why Kanye West is once again making headlines and why entertainment tonight's Kevin Frazier is being put out on blast, baby, because of his interview with Sharon Osbourne. I don't think He wanted the smoke. It's Friday, and that means the business of being Black is another round of the political and trending highlights of the week. Oh, baby, we want the smoke, so bring it. Please welcome my Friday co-host, the co-founder of the Anti-Racism Kentucky Coalition, Dr. O.J. Oleka is here. Hi, Dr. O.J. Hey, Tammy. Comedian and filmmaker Alicia Cooper in the house. What's up, Lee? Hey, Tammy. Activist and radio personality Dominique DePrima is here. Hi, Dominique. Happy Friday. And political analyst Ed Sanders, of course, is joining us today. Hi, Ed. Hey, Tammy. So a bipartisan group of Republican senators are looking to bring Supreme Court proceedings to television. Senate Majority Whip and Judiciary Committee Chair Dick Durbin and Senator Chuck Grassley, the com- uh, the committee's rather uh, top Republican, introduced a bill on Thursday that would require the Supreme Court to allow public court proceedings to be televised. Mm. So the high court currently does not permit television cameras. However, Senator Durbin said it's time to put cameras in the Supreme Court so Americans can finally see deliberations and rulings on cases which will affect them for generations to come. Senator Grassley added opening up the Supreme Court's public proceedings to cameras and other broadcast tools provides a window into the court for all Americans not just those in D.C. Now, under the bill, the court could exempt proceedings from television uh, coverage if a majority vote among the justice found that it would violate parties' due process rights. Well, should we see this? I mean, why not? We got Judge Judy. We got Judge Mathis. We got uh, (laughs) Judge Kevin Ross. We got Judge Lynn Tober. We got, uh, I mean, why not have Supreme Court judges on TV? Well, I think we should. I mean, look, we're talking about transparency. We're talking about one of the three branches of the federal government. We spend a lot of attention talking about the presidency and, and a little less, but more about the uh, the Congress and what's happening in the Senate and the House. But you don't get to actually see what's happening in the Supreme Court. And arguably, the Supreme Court may have more impact on your life than, than any of the other two branches. And so, you know, I, I'm all for transparency. And so any chance you can, let's let's shine a light on it. Let the people see Dominique, you're laughing. Why so? I'm laughing because I feel like this is the Trump influence on the Republican Party. You said a bipartisan group of Republican senators. Okay, so <laughs> where's the bipartisan part? But, um, you know, they want everything to be a reality show. It worked for Trump. Why not the Supreme Court? I'm for it if they keep the body cams on the justices for the whole day so we can see all the other twisted things they do, like Kavanaugh and his beer and, you know, whatever Clarence Thomas is up to. If we can really get some real 24 seven transparency, I'd be all for that. Well, leave it to a progressive to ruin a good bipartisan idea. (laughs) I was gonna say I was for this until Dominique injected herself into the conversation. I mean, I think it is good that the Supreme Court uh, would be transparent, would be open as a conservative. I think that is a positive thing. Uh, And quite frankly, the fact that you have judiciary leaders that you've got Chuck Grassley, that position is well-respected on the Republican side, I think both sides uh, for sure. Uh, And President Biden was once a judiciary chair, so this thing might actually have legs, Uh, but quite frankly, I think it's good so that people can stop saying that the court, just because it has people appointed uh, more by Republicans, that it's some crazy backward court. Now we can actually see what are people asking, what questions are being asked by judges, and who's falling asleep. I think this would be a good thing for the country uh, if it gets done. Alicia? I'll tune in as long as it's produced by the people who do The Bachelor. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Nobody's going to watch that. Who's going to watch the Supreme Court? 
I am a fan. I am totally a fan of every, most people love those housewives and shows like that. I am a judge show, reality show junkie since, uh, uh, what's the man that started it off? Uh, judge Wapner. Ooh. Yeah, I go way back. Yeah, you took, <laughs> you took us back. <laughs> I go way back. I have loved it since Judge Wapner and everybody. I quote. I don't quote Shakespeare. I don't quote Martin Luther King Jr. I quote Judge Judy. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what would be interesting is if this led to a more celebritization of the court, though, to Dominique's point. I mean, you could see uh, maybe Joe Biden decides he wants to appoint Judge Judy or maybe some Republican appoints some judge that has more camera flair. I think that'd be probably bad, but it certainly would be interesting. Yeah, Justice Obama. I love that. Michelle, of course, I'm talking about. <laughs> ah, ha, ha, ha. Well, I, I look, I think that people should be more... Uh, sh should be more involved in politics and certainly in our, our justice system. And so I think if you put them on TV, make them famous, more people become interested in what really matters and, and touches their lives in a real way. This might not be a bad idea and it might swing me over to the right side. On over. Far right side, because you know that's an extreme <laughs> court. They call it the Supreme Court, but it's really the extreme court. The extreme court. Maybe that's the name of what the name of the television show could be. I like it. I like extreme it. Court. <laughs> look, look, we, we produce it already, Dominique. What are you saying? It's like, this is going to work. So according to CNN, New York Governor Cuomo is leaning on Black Democrats, Democrats and old friends as he fights for his political future. On March 17th, Governor Cuomo attended Mount... <laughs> I can't even... I can't even finish. I can't even finish. Boy, I tell you, Black folk, we will come to somebody's rescue in a heartbeat. And it is amazing how folk can come to us for their rescue. But mm -hmm. when we need rescue, won't nobody rescue us. Amen. I can't understand. I can't understand. So he goes to this Baptist church in Harlem to get the coronavirus vaccine with black political and spiritual leaders, many of whom uh, he's known, uh, has known his family for decades. Uh, <laughs> those same leaders are repaying uh, that attention by not only standing by Governor Cuomo, but uh, by loudly backing the due process and time that the governor is asking for. So has Andrew Cuomo done enough for New York's African-American community to justify this unwavering support? No. Does no. he have, does he have the African-American equity that yeah, I mean, he needs for- Isn't it like what you've done for me lately? I mean, I, I mean honestly, uh, you know, I, be the greatest but doesn't he have to talk about what he's going to do and then continue to do it um you know i i think a couple things one if he continues to deliver you can consider that but certainly you know this is the, the accusations that have been made against him are are it's really hard to look past that and just because you went to church i, I don't think you're going to get the black community behind you but, but this is what democrat politicians do all the time which is why it's such a fascinating story you have Chuck Schumer, the majority leader of the United States Senate, who's a senator from New York, calling on Cuomo to resign. You have Kirsten Gillibrand, the other senator from New York, who is the reason Al Franken resigned, calling on Andrew Cuomo to resign. Now, he has been accused of sexual harassment by several aides. He also allegedly covered up the numbers of nursing home deaths due to COVID. And so where does he go? He goes to black voters. He says, look, I might have assaulted some women, maybe harassed them, maybe fudged the numbers on old people dying, but I'll just use black voters as a prop to pull me out of my political troubles. Why is it that black voters are always asked by Democrats to clean up their messes? To me, I think that's an interesting question that people ought to start asking themselves. So you're saying he's like the R. Kelly of governors? Is that like kind of what you're saying? I mean, because people will keep listening to R. Kelly, doesn't matter what he does, they keep listening and cha cha to that. I don't. I say you about to lose your job. Get this dance? I think so. Um, honestly, I do believe in due process and I agree because of the mistake that they made with Al Franken uh, and I, I guess, you know, the endless due process that our former president gets. 
that people should go through due process. The problem that Cuomo has is now you're starting to hear um, verified claims that may, you know, stand without too much investigation. Some of them are demonstrably provable with witnesses. So I, I, I think he's going to need more than the black church. It. Yeah, I mean, listen again. It's it. Well, black I mean, Jesus come to the rescue right. for Andrew <laughs> Cuomo. I mean, it's very Trumpian, right? I mean, you know, like look, look at my black people; they're supporting me, you know. And so, I, you wow. know, again, <laughs> when you look at it, it, it you, I think most people can see through this. But you know, if Cuomo stepped to the table with with something that that the community really wanted, like abolishing qualified immunity for police officers, uh, yeah, you know, I think people would would stand in line for it, but. At this point, you know, he's got a long road to to, to get back to uh, the good graces of, of people in New York. Alicia, is Black Jesus coming to Andrew Cuomo's rescue or what? Um, You know, I mean, people really liked him prior to this. You know, it's just really sad that it's come to this, but I don't think that's enough going to get a vaccination in a, in a Black church in Harlem. I don't think that's enough. And you know, as the numbers keep piling up, a new aide came out today that's currently working working with him, and it's just not looking good. One thing I can say for us is that we don't really stand behind uh, the people in our party that do those types of things. So I don't think he'll get the support in the long run. Like like Dominique said, he's he's going to get due process, but we will step aside and let you fall. I remember when uh, Gail King was friends with Charlie Rose. And they used to laugh every single morning together. When Charlie's stuff came out, Gail stepped aside and let him fall. All Gail said was, oh, Charlie. It was so sad. I said, damn, poor Charlie. Like, we know how to step aside and let you drown. And, and if that's what has to happen for Mr. Cuomo, that's what has to happen. Well, you said, uh, you know, going to the black church to take a couple of vaccines is not going to do it. If you went to the black church and sang Tamala Mann's Take Me to the King, <laughs> would that would that do it? <laughs> no, <laughs> because the king with a wheelbarrow full of reparations, that might do it. Right. Right. <laughs> right. Hail Mary full of reparations. I like money. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, we, we know he can't sing, so he's going to have to do a little bit more. Oh, we're going to take a quick <laughs> break and come right back on the Tammy McAlee Show on Fox Soul. Black people have always made a way out of no way. And Hollywood is no different. Because the images we see on screen impact our beliefs and our actions. And they last forever. Problems, problems, problems. He don't know how to save money. She loves that. I have a serious problem. Who wants to hear them? I do. Yes or no? Did you break the lamp in I Texas? did not care for it in the way that I should have. Oh, wow. In the streets, we call it squash and beef. He said yes. Stop right there. Were you I lying? I would call it a great attack. So here we go. Mediation is about to begin. The Mediator with Ice T. Weekdays, 5.30 p.m. Eastern, 2.30 p.m. Pacific, right here on Fox Soul. So. Welcome back to the Tammy McLeod Show on Fox Soul. Uh, okay, if Governor Cuomo were African American and dealing with the same allegations, would he receive the same support from Black leaders? 
Huh? Now, Alicia, you say, look, black folk know when to drop you. And uh, Dominique says, look, it's like R. Kelly thing. We're going to still listen to his music and we know he's sexually harassing women. So what if Cuomo were black? America would have never elected a black male bachelor to a position that they're going to They'd be like, they'd be having all kinds of, of, of uh, parties in there. They, they would, he wouldn't have gotten as far as a black male bachelor. So <laughs> you better not only better, you, you need to be married, be married for a long time and be seen coming in and out of somebody's church if you could be black and get that much daggone power. So this this isn't even something that could happen for a black male. Y'all better have all your ducks in a row. Mm. Sadly, That's Alicia white actually privilege. is probably right on this. We've only had four <laughs> black governors in the history of the country. So if Cuomo was in fact black and was a bachelor and had these issues, because I mean, I mean, let's be honest, if, if these things are coming out now, there were probably whispers earlier in his career. He's also the son of a governor. So he's probably gotten away with a lot of things that a black man in New York probably wouldn't have, which is a sad reality that that is the state of things because he wouldn't have gotten this far. And quite frankly, he probably shouldn't have if he's willing to harass people who work with him and lie to make himself look good on national television while talking to his brother on CNN. This is not a man who deserves to have power this is not a man who deserves to be governor, and he certainly certainly shouldn't be elected for a fourth term. Okay. Yeah, um, well, I think we did see this. I mean, Harold Ford, when he ran for Senate, you know, he was a, a single black man running, and and the Republican Party ran that ad, you know, with the with the white lady winking at the camera, and that was enough to sink his candidacy. And uh, he, ain't he half white? <laughs> to the point, you know, <laughs> one drop rule. Um, but, you know, we're seeing it play out in the NFL right now. He, with thought, the he, thought, he, he thought he was half white. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we know how I'm sorry, Ed, I didn't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. No, no, I was going to say we're seeing it play out in the NFL right now with, with Deshaun Watson and uh, yeah. as, uh, the quarterback of the Texans. Um, you know, I think a lot of questions about, you know, th uh, that particular case and as that moves forward. But you know, to Alicia's point, you know, it's it's a tough road for a black man in, in a public opinion when you're talking about sexual um, assault or sexual, you know, predatory, that sort of thing. I think most folks are uh, uh, aware of how this country perceives black men in that regard. Absolutely. Uh, so if you want more of this content, it's easy. All you have to do is subscribe to our YouTube channel and make sure you hit the notification uh, bell so you can get all the best updates and the new videos and live shows. And don't forget to click that thumbs up button and tell us how you feel in the comments section. If you wonder who these people are that are talking today on the Tammy McLeod Show, they are our Friday favorites joining us, please. It is Dr. O.J. Oleka, not to be confused, uh, comedian and filmmaker Alicia Cooper, activist and radio personality Dominique De Prima and political analyst Ed Sanders. So um, during an interview on conservative podcasts out loud with Gianno Codwell, Ben Carson, former secretary of housing and urban development during Trump's administration spoke about how black conservatives are treated by black people who don't share their political beliefs. He shockingly compared how black Republicans are treated to the brutally harm and dehumanization that runaway slaves faced. He said the following, just remember that this is not anything that's any different than many, many years ago during slavery. If you ran away and you got caught, they didn't just kill you. They brought you back and tormented you in front of everyone else so that you would get the lesson. Do not run away. Do you think for yourself, and if you do, we're gonna try and make an example of you so that other people won't do it. But the way I see it, you have to just ask yourself, what is the right thing to do? You have to pray and ask God to give you wisdom and move forward. What are your thoughts on this statement, Dr. Oleka? Well, at the very least, this is incredibly unfortunate. First of all, he's wrong. <laughs> Let me be unequivocal about this. Dr. Ben Carson is wrong. There is nothing more brutal in the history of this country than chattel slavery, period, point blank. Being a black Republican, sure, it can be lonely sometimes. It can be very frustrating, like this very moment, as a matter of fact. But it can also be hopeful. It can be countercultural in a positive way. That ain't slavery. And Dr. Ben Carson is wrong on this. He said things like this before, compared things to slavery, which, again, you should never do. And I appreciate his contributions to medicine, uh, but he's absolutely wrong on this. It. Yeah, I, I think he got the wrong the wrong analogy. I mean, when you talk about uh, it, it's really more the the house slave that he should be comparing himself to. Uh, 
Um, you know, when you think about Republicans and conservatives, you can divorce yourself of the ideology. Conservatives don't have to support the Republican Party. Um, the Republican Party's ideology is really clear. Uh, we've talked about this a number of different times. In fact, you know, as we watched this week, as Senator Raphael Warnock gave his uh, maiden speech on the Senate floor, he talked about voting rights. And he was really an indictment against the Republican Party and all of the actions that it's taken both nationally and at the state and local level to restrict people's voting rights. That's the Republican Party. Now, you can be conservative. You know, I think our friend OJ here is conservative, but you don't have to necessarily support the Republican Party. Ben Carson is out of line because he was supporting the Republican Party the way he did. Dominique? Well, I Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, Dr. I, there, there are a couple issues that I, I take uh, or a couple characterizations in which I, I take issue with. First, the Republican Party. Uh, and if you are a black Republican, you should not be uh, calling yourself or comparing yourself to a House Negro. Uh, I don't think that's anything that we should be doing, uh, which is what uh, my dear friend Ed here just suggested. I think also, too, when you're looking at the Republican Party across the board, Absolutely, voting rights are a concern and some things that are happening in states, but in Kentucky, the state where I'm from, our Republican Secretary of State just got a bill passed that expands voting rights, that expands voting opportunities and allows for more mail-in ballots and allows for an expanded uh, vote in terms of three days for absentee. This is incredibly huge for the franchise of voting and incredibly beneficial to the black community. Now, here's the problem though. When you have Ben Carson, a very prominent, very well-known black Republican saying the things that he says, it now gives license for folks like Ed or anybody else to make these claims. This is the problem that I've got. Who was he making these statements for, Ben Carson? Who do they win over? What black Republican hears this and says, yep, I'm coming to the GOP. Thanks, Ben. Nobody does that. And so it's incredibly frustrating to hear someone with his position make statements that are false and that are hurtful and harmful to the cause. I don't even know how to respond, but uh, you know, other than I, one bill in Kentucky uh, is not representative of the Republican Party's stance on, on voting rights. And it, it, it's very clear to see that across the country. Um, the Republican Party has acted in economic policy and civil rights policy uh, uh, to restrict rights for specifically for people of color. And that's why, that again, that is why Ben Carson gets out of line. Now, you can have the ideological debate. Again, you know, we could talk about different issues, and I don't think that we necessarily would agree. But what's really clear is that the Republican Party stakes out the position that's there to restrict for people of color. And again, that's why Ben Carson is out of line, and that's why Black Republicans um, get uh, analogized the way they do. Again, that's not true. The Republican Party is not designed to restrict the rights of Black voters since its inception. In fact, it was designed for the very opposite. And you can look throughout the history of the party to show that that's true, whether it wasn't the Voting Rights Act, like a higher majority percentage of Republicans supported those bills. Supports HR1. And when it comes to educational choice Name and opportunities one. and economic development, the Republican Party across the board has been supportive. Just wow. because the party doesn't suggest that you should tax people more and put in more regulations does not mean it, it is a racist party. I think it is very disingenuous to have this conversation one Republican and assume that all who black supports Republicans the are racist and people act. Name one. Name one Republican who supports HR1, the For the People Act. Republicans have a nationwide campaign going on right now, specifically targeted to disenfranchise black voters, to get rid of souls to the polls by outlawing Sunday voting. All these things that they're doing state by state, where they lost, especially in places where, where Democrats are making headway, they're targeting black voters. Name one. One Republican who supports HR1, the massive voting rights bill in the spirit of John Lewis that has passed the House, and we won't be able to pass it through the Senate unless we reform the filibuster because Republicans don't want Black people to vote. No, again, that's a falsehood. That's First of all, true. if you don't support so name HR1, a person, one, name a Republican that that's you don't support it. voting rights. You, you don't have to support one. HR1 to support voting rights. Again, HR1 They're talking is a lot a because you bill. can't name one. Because you don't have to name one. Just because oh, okay. you don't support you don't have to HR1 name anybody that, that supports support voting, voting rights in the Republican Party to make the point that the Republican Party supports voting rights, that doesn't make any sense. No, because this Let's is a tactic, state, okay. and I think it's important that viewers understand what's happening. HR1 yes. is a specific bill that is partisan, that is progressive aligned, that takes over voting at the federal level. 
State should have the opportunity to make it their vote. It is voting. not partisan. Now, again, it gets rid of dark money in politics. It creates same voting day voter registration. How is it partisan? People. It is not partisan. It is All partisan it does is protect it voting rights. The federal government to be it in gets the dirty money out of politics. It level. protects voting rights. It is not partisan. Unless by partisan, you mean black people voting, poor people voting, working people voting. If that's what you mean by partisan, then yes, the for the Again, people black is As I've explained, and I think it's important for people to understand, and this goes back to Ben Carson's comments, you don't get to have these conversations if black Republicans don't have self-inflicted wounds like what Dr. Carson said. First and foremost, point blank. The Republican Party, again, for the 50th mm -hmm. time, is not the party of self-hating black republicans it's not the party that hates people of color it simply has a different it simply has policies that hate to people. provide opportunities for people well, it. it's that simple we want lower taxes limited government and people want to protect civil rights now i recognize that for a lot of folks it may look and sound and feel differently but what i'm offering to you today is this ed says that you can't hold up a single state and say this is the way things ought to be. I think that you can. I think that you can offer a different. Yeah. So let's standardize it with HR one. And you mansplaining and over talking doesn't change the fact that you cannot name one Republican who is supporting a massive voter rights bill that is completely nonpartisan. Standardizes elections so that we don't have the kind of voter fraud that. Donald Trump was imagining and having delusions about that never happened. But in case you're worried about it happening in the future, you should be supporting H.R. 1. And yet not one Republican does. The Republicans are the party that doesn't want black people to vote. They've made that clear in Arizona. They have made it clear in That's Georgia. It. And Georgia, they are clear Florida. H.R. 1. Again, President Trump won more black voters. Why would the Republican Party want to disenfranchise voters when there's an opportunity to Georgia. win that. Quite frankly, Dominique, it's not mansplaining if I'm in the middle of an explanation and then you start to talk over me. Your explanation never ends. Is. You don't leave room for anyone else to talk. That's the definition of mansplaining. Well, I'm going to leave room for a commercial break right here. We're going <laughs> to off and uh, get us something to get us right, right? And uh, we'll be back on the Tammy McLeod Show on Fox Soul. Tammy Mac. Tammy Mac. You were one of the first people to be vocal about how things were over at that network. Hollywood Unlocked Uncensored. No one believed me. Looking back at it, how could they? Because the depiction of me was problematic. Every Friday. I feel like these networks that are ran by a bunch of white people create conversations and experiences for the culture that are really negative. I just feel like we will sign up to be on TV at any cost. <laughs> we have to stop participating in that. That's the bottom line. They stepped up and enlisted to bravely serve our country, but life is challenging, and sometimes we need a shoulder for support. Two things that should never go together, veterans and homelessness. That's where U.S. Vets comes in. Founded by veterans to uplift veterans, U.S. Vets is an army of professional staff, donors, veterans, and civilian volunteers alike. U.S. Vets is the home base for opportunities. <laughs> what we laughing about, ladies? What we laughing about? Uh, cocktails with Queens. Staying in some Mondays. Cocktails with the Queens. Lisa Ray, your name and uh, one of your classic roles has been trending. You trend a lot, my friend. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Sip and serve every Monday night. Drea Michelle posted on social media that she'd be the right choice to play Diamond from the Players Club movie. Let Diamond be Diamond. Maybe somebody can play Cubic Zirconia or something. <laughs> on Fox Soul. <laughs> Back to the Tammy Mac Late Show on Fox Soul, where we are just covering everything that happened this week with some of our Friday favorites. Dr. Olake is in the house, as well as Ed Sanders, Dominic DePrima, and Alicia Cooper. So let's go to, uh, I don't want to leave our soulmates out of this hectic, hot, 
and bothered, fiery conversation, uh, Julia Dawkins. Hi, Julia. Welcome to the show. She says, I knew they were lying about the nursing homes because we got hit hard, especially in New York City. Uh, Incock says, Alicia is right about having to be married as a black governor in New York. We had David Patterson and he was open about extramarital affairs and then an eventual divorce. New York doesn't want a messy politician. Um, okay, Dr. Ben Carson has been wrong about a lot lately, except neuroscience. He needs to focus on medicine. I don't know, nobody went to him when we were talking about the coronavirus. I don't understand why. That's, that's, it is an interesting point there. Hold on, we got some more here. Um, okay, let's see. They couldn't get enough attention or a takedown on the nursing home scandal, but Me Too accusations will surely get a person canceled in this era. Uh, and uh, we'll go right back. Uh, let's see. Cuomo does not have the African American equity on lock. He couldn't even make use of the black speechwriter in his own damn office. Give me a break. Uh, and I'm not sure who Racine is saying talks too much. Who talks too much, Racine? Welcome to the show, Racine. Thank you for being here. She said he, so it was either Ed <laughs> or Dr. Oleka. <laughs> <laughs> was that mansplaining? I'm telling yeah, you. I'll so, take the hit, OJ. I think it was me. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, let's, let's get a little uh, serious here for a minute. Eight people including six Asian women are dead following a series of shootings that happened at three massage parlors in Atlanta on Tuesday. The shootings are the latest acts of violence against Asian people in this country, which has risen significantly in the past year, in large due to racist rhetoric after the pandemic. 21-year-old uh, Robert Long, a white resident from Georgia, was arrested in connection with the shootings and charged with eight counts of murder and one count of aggravated assault. Some people have said the act stems from the overwhelmingness of his sexual addiction and the spas he targeted were a temptation that he wanted to eliminate. There are people saying, no, this, this had nothing to do with Asians. This had nothing to do with hate. This strictly had to do with sex. And let's not leave out that he had a really bad day. During the press conference, Cherokee County Sheriff's Department Captain Jay Baker said the Atlanta shooter was having a really bad day. And this is what he did. Is this just another fine example of white privilege? Absolutely, absolutely. Kirk Franklin said he had a porn addiction. Michael Douglas said he had a sexual addiction. There's a lot of people who said they had sexual addictions. They never went into Asian massage parlor shooting people up it's, it's just just an excuse you know and, it, and we cannot let it get by we can't let him they have to throw the full weight of the law against this man so that other people won't think that they're going to get a slap on the wrist this was absolutely ridiculous it was a hate crime and it needs to be treated as such you can't they can't keep using these dumb excuses and that's exactly what it was a sex addiction made you get a an assault rifle and start shooting a bunch of people that makes absolutely no sense. Like, come on, we, we really got to stop playing games with these people. And then the sheriff, he was repeating, he said he was repeating what the guy said, that the guy said he was having a really bad day. First of all, nobody black would have been able to get that repeated. They're not going to give us any kind of excuse that could possibly humanize us after we've done something that's damn crazy. He, the sheriff should have never repeated that. And then they found out from the sheriff's social media that he has anti-Asian bias and anti-Asian racism on his social media. So he's running cover for this guy because he's just like this guy. And it's just, it's sad, it just runs so deep. And we all knew that when Donald Trump started all that anti-Asian rhetoric, that nothing good was gonna come of it. So a lot of this lies, a lot of this blood is on his hands also. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I, I agree with you, Alicia. And, and I think it was more of how the sheriff said it. He said it with empathy. He said it with sympathy. He said Absolutely. it from the bottom of his heart. He didn't say, according to the victim, he was having a bad day. He, he, he said it as if to uh, cover for his friend and make him feel better. He said it out of comfort. And that I think is what really sent people uh, crazy. Yeah. Dominique? Yeah, he pro they probably took him to Burger King. Well, I mean, I had to, 
wonder in my mind, this guy is obviously a sympathizer, the sheriff spokesperson. One, why wasn't he fired? He's got this, you know, racist stuff up on his on his social media. And two, I'm wondering if he's telling the perpetrator or the suspect, you know, hey, say it wasn't a hate crime, because if it was a hate crime, you're going to get extra time. So to me, absolutely, this is a hate crime. Absolutely. It is Asian hate. And, you know, it's ridiculous to try to say that it isn't. It's all part of the package known as white supremacy. And the other thing, you know, that I would add, I think we have to, all of us have to stand in solidarity with the Asian American community. 3,800 hate crimes in one year against Asian Pacific Islander communities. That is completely unacceptable. And this sheriff should be fired. This, This guy should not get kid gloves and we need to take this, we do need to take this seriously. I don't even wanna say the guy's name. You know, I don't wanna give him any fame and fortune. If a slaveholder um, had sex with his enslaved people, which many did, and they had a sex addiction, does that mean they're not a racist? Yeah, no, I think you're, you're nailing it, Dominique. I mean, when you, when you look at it and you look at, um, you know, what he describes as, as his sexual addiction, and it's this fetidization of, of Asian women, that in itself is born of, of this notion of white supremacy, right? And, and you know, to dive in too deep on, on the show is, is not appropriate, but um, I think you're nailing it right on when, when we talk about why this is a hate crime against Asian women. Um, I think there's another issue that has to be be looked at, and it's a it's a national security issue, and we've got to look at this issue of these uh, the the subculture known as incels, right? These involuntary celibates, as they call them, and it's just counterculture. It's out of this group that there's been a number of these different mass shootings, and we're talking about typically white males um, not doing well uh, either academically or economically staying at home on the computer, which is where they're, they're digesting all of this porn and, and stuff like this. Um, and they get their minds warped and a lot of them are, are snapping and you're seeing these mass murders take place. Um, and after that takes place, these guys are being lauded as hero in that subculture. And so, you know, I hope there's a lot of energy put forward over the next, uh, next few in the uh, years as we start to talk about what we can do to counteract what's happening in that subculture. Dr. Oleka. Yeah, this is this is one area where I do struggle to, to be calm. Again, to the, the viewers who don't know, my wife uh, is half Filipino. And we have talked about this all week. This is the type of thing that, if not controlled, this type of hate leads to these type of situations, these incidents. I agree 100% with what Dominique was saying, with what Ed was saying, with what Alicia was saying. This is racism, the way that Asian women are exoticized in our country, in the world, and the fact that you look at them as objects to simply be murdered if you cannot control yourself is textbook definition, white supremacy. This is hatred. This is evil. And to that sheriff, I wonder if he would have felt that same way if this young white man went into a tanning salon and killed six white women. Would he say he was just having a bad day then? Or would it be a terrible tragedy for the American community that so many souls were lost? This is the problem when we don't value people equally. We start to say it's just a bad day when eight people lose a family member that they love because of what they look like and because of who they are. It is disgusting. And I think that we need to do more to make sure this doesn't happen to people within that community. I don't know if it's, you know how when you get ready to buy a new car, you see that car everywhere you go, or when you get pregnant, you all of a sudden see a bunch of pregnant women. Uh, (laughs) I don't know if it's because it's what's in my mind now, but it seems like even though we have made it clear through the 2020 movement, world movement that was had through Black Lives Matter, uh, through John Lewis and, and Congress people, I don't know why it continues to happen if we have explained and we have cried out in the largest of ways we could possibly cry out that people who are not white are dehumanized over and over and over again. So why is it that they don't get it yet? So it seems to me like I'm all the time now seeing people, white people not getting it. 
And that's what I, why I use the comparison of when you get ready to buy a Toyota, you see Toyotas all the time. When you, see, you get pregnant, you see pregnant women all the time. It's like now, whenever something happens, I see white people dehumanizing people all the time. It, I mean, it happens over and over again. We're not going to go into it, but Sharon Osbourne, when it comes to uh, uh, Cheryl Underwood telling her, don't you dare cry. And, and, and then they, they not thinking anything of it. But I want to kind of switch this whole conversation to something that could be very sens a sensitive subject. A lot of people have posted, and particularly a significant amount of Black people, stop Asian hate on their social media platforms. But there are other Black people who are saying, hey, where were the Asians when the Black Lives Matter movement happened? Where are these people when we're killed, when we're hurt? I, I took a different perspective on my social media today and I, I posted stop white terrorism because really that is the crust of the problem. The problem is we let these white terrorists live. They suffer no consequences other than a nice little sweet time in jail. And, and it happens over and over and over again. Meanwhile, you take a a black man who's selling five dollar weed or allegedly uh, uh, still in a backpack and you lock them up for years, decades. I don't understand what's going on right now. And I really think that the narrative is stop white terrorism more than it's stop Asian hate or Black Lives Matter for that for that matter. There's a bigger problem here and it has nothing to do with Asians. It has nothing to do with black people. It has nothing to do with Hispanics. It has to do with white folk and the way that they view everyone who is other than white. We'll take a break. Come right back on the Tammy McAlate show on Fox Soul. Before we go, we have a little surprise guest. Oh, hey! Oh, in the building! Fox Soul presents The Mix. I have missed y'all so much. Aww. I've been watching all the shows. Every Tuesday night. It's been fun, but I can't wait to join you guys next week. Next week? That's official? Is real? I'll be, I'll be back next week, baby. You know March is my month. I cannot miss The Mix this month. Period. Yes! Oh, yeah. Dang, coming through. I feel like, like her heartbeat is like same speed as mine. And I think we have this like deep connection, this heart connection in her heart that there's, there's room for me and mom. When I'm holding her, it makes me feel calmer. It's a sensory thing. It's a thing with Asperger's. She's really good with Anya. I've seen adults react to my daughter when she has meltdowns, like she's from a different planet. And this little animal just sat next to my child and was just like, you know, it's going to be cool. She's my superhero. Good job, kitty cat. When we adopted Lucky, we discovered all the wonderful things that make her unique. Lucky's a little bit of a lot of things, but mostly she's pure love. You and I met about 10 years ago. I pulled up on you. I think we was at a chicken wing spot. I don't know, it was some real hood <laughs> Fox Soul presents. I was like, Mo really is hood. She really is about that life. Hollywood Unlocked, Uncensored. We instantly clicked and then you just yep. disappeared. I separated myself not only from you, but from my family. I even separated myself from my daughters. Every Friday. I was just like, I'm making so many mistakes. I don't want them to become this. Show. Welcome back to the Tammy McLeod Show on Fox Soul. So we're going to lighten it up just a little bit. Uh, I mentioned Sharon Osbourne earlier. Kevin Frazier uh, of ET, right, is feeling. Oh, speaking of entertainment tonight, uh, uh, shouts out, uh, shouts out to um, Nichelle for being the first Black woman to co-host Entertainment Tonight. That's that's a big deal. So I had to give my sister because she used to. I don't know if you remember Dominique, but she used to be on. Uh, uh, used to be 
a roving reporter on the new on the local u- news in LA. Oh, that's right. You remember? Yes. Yeah. And, and I have always been fascinated with her reporting and, and her style. And to, to see her go so far, I'm just so like she's such a role model. I'm, I'm fascinated with her journey. Uh, but Kevin Frazier is feeling the heat for posting on his social media that prominent black women in Hollywood should get together. Educate Sharon Osborne on race. His post did not sit well with actress and racial justice advocate Amanda Seals, who replied, you must be out of your goddamn mind. How about you put your energy into providing a safe space for those on the show who have been terrorized by her rampant racism, classism. <laughs> what was funny to me was she said, how about you put the, the red, the, how about you put your little jacket puddle, uh, take your little jacket that you're trying to put the, with how do your white women walk the puddle over? I mean, Amanda Seals went off completely. Uh, well, Kevin Frazier shot back. Say, I've been doing that for years. I wanted to hear your thoughts. That's why I tagged you. I respect your opinion, not trying to get into a scrap. And Seals replied, well, you missed the mark this time, brother. Why should black people be tasked with educating white people about racism? Or should we? Should we? Should should it be our job to tell white folk, hey, 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 it's not good. We won't do that. Well, I mean, look, this has been part of the conversation about anti-racism. It's one of the big bullet points. White people educate yourself and each other. Read a book, how to be an anti-racist. Read Abram X. Kendi, read uh, Robin D'Angelo, read Frederick Douglass, read James Baldwin, read a book. I Girl, think- ain't nobody read no books, Dominique. I just, just give me a list of shit I can say and can't say to black people. Well, you know, it's, but it has to go deeper than that. You can't just stop being a racist, Sharon Osbourne. You have to learn to be an anti-racist. I do want to throw in that a lot of Asian Americans did march with Black Lives Matter. A lot of Asians and Black people have been in solidarity for a long time. The only Black Panther Party leadership member who was not Black was a Japanese American. And so I think our solidarity does go back. It just doesn't get a lot of play. I sort of look at this question about educating folks. It, it's almost like it evangelism in a sort of way. Uh, some folks don't want to do that. It's obviously, I don't think it's our place as black folks to have to educate people on anything. But if you end up being close to some white coworkers or white friends or whatever, and they feel comfortable asking you questions, if there's an opportunity. <laughs> yeah, well, right. I, I know. Yeah, Kevin Frazier is regretting that one. I went on Amanda's Instagram page and I said, I bet you he won't tag you no more. <laughs> Never I don't again. Know who, he, who he thought he was tagging, because everybody knows that that's not one you want to play with. And that's not one who's going to take any of her time out to educate no 68 year old white woman from the UK who's making more money than a little bit and sits there on that show saying the craziest stuff. She, when they were talking about Megan Markle, she was like, Megan Markle ain't black. And I was like, see, this was months ago. I was like, first of all, who are you to determine who is and who is not black? You know, so I'm like, she said some stuff. And then the reason she can, um, you know, she's such good friends with peers is because they're just alike. And if that's your good friend, you don't have to go on Twitter to tell them you support him. Call him. That should have been a private conversation between the two of y'all. <laughs> well, so, I, 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 I also, I find it interesting how when it comes to other ethnicities in particularly, uh, people are very sensitive about what matters and what doesn't matter and what's offensive and not offensive. So I'm waiting for the day when um, people are, are more sensitive 
about what they say and how they speak to black people. You know, I want people to be like, oh, hold on. You can't say that. No, 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 no. Because there are other, uh, uh, I don't know how to phrase it, uh, other ethnicities, other people, uh, groups of people, collective groups of people who you're a little, you know that people are scared to say something about them because if they did, they would lose their job immediately. They would get cast out of whatever club they're in immediately. There are certain things you cannot say or speak out loud about different ethnicities. And so I'm ready for that to be the case with black people. I'm ready for people to think twice before they speak a certain type of language around black people. Sharon Osbourne should have felt like she would think, she should have thought twice. She should have felt like she needed to think twice before saying what she said to, to, to Cheryl Underwood. She chastised her like a child. Mm. And she yeah, felt- and that, that whole, yeah. Yeah, that whole, don't you dare cry. I've yeah, never heard know. a white woman say that to another white woman. White women are allowed to cry even when they've been fake and phony. They allowed to cry. So for her to tell that lady, don't you dare cry. I should be the one crying. What should you be crying for? Both of the ladies said they didn't think you were racist. Now you manufacturing reasons why you should cry. And the black, see, they never think black women can be vulnerable. And these are the, the conversations we need to have with these women. Why couldn't Cheryl cry? If and, that and, and the white you women's crying, tears you are weaponized. The white yeah. women's tears are weaponized against us so often. So why can't Cheryl cry? And how does Osborne get away with not just disrespecting black people? She has made anti-Asian comments. She has made anti-LGBTQ plus comments. She just been on a roll. <laughs> yeah, she's been on a roll. Incog said, it is not black people's job to dismantle the institution of racism that they created. It's your problem, not my responsibility. Uh, Kevin was way off about putting the onus on black people. From what I understand, oh, I don't even want to say that part. Incog, I can't say that part. I'm good. I'm good on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, black Beauty Trending says Amanda Red Kevin for 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 blank, and um, and uh, Amen Dominique. Black Beauty Trending says Amen Dominique. Yeah, I'm just ready for people to be like, oh, don't say that. Don't say don't you know if you say that, the black community gonna come after you. You don't want to say that. Yeah, That's we got we got we got to get a little bit more power, you yeah. know. You, I, I think y'all got a story coming up about what is it, the United Negro? What's what's the uh, the United Negro? What's when we finally got a black co per, go co chair? What is that, the United Negro College no, Fund? Was yeah, well, now, Alicia, like, we, uh, Alicia, you got to let me lead the show now. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, well, my point was we can't even be the lead of stuff with the word Negro in it. We ain't got <laughs> enough power yet. We're gonna take a break and we're gonna come back. <laughs> on the Tammy McLeish show on Fox Soul. <laughs> Leah, I'm getting real thirsty, baby. I'm sorry. Can you give us a break? Yeah. Fox Soul presents The Mix. The Bachelor franchise might be trying to do a cleanup on IO racism. It's insane to me that it took how many seasons to get a Black Bachelor? Every Tuesday night. It was clear to me that they did set him up to choose a white woman. Even if they had 30 black women on there, if you pick a black man that likes white women, he's going to pick a white woman. White woman. <laughs> like, you know, that. <laughs> Stream it live. Not completing high school is more of a social thing than it was an academic thing. Even though all these years have passed, I still had that longing to have my diploma. I have a mentor, and she convinced me to continue my education. No one receives a diploma alone. If you're even considering getting your high school diploma, go get it. You can do it. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. The need to care for one another has never been greater. And even though our daily lives are different, one fact remains unchanged. Blood is needed every day. You can help save the lives of cancer patients and so many others who depend on blood to heal. If you're in good health, please make an appointment to donate. The American Red Cross adheres to the highest standards of safety and infection control. Visit redcrossblood.org to schedule your appointment now. 
Candy versus daughter's father is claiming that the Real Housewives star was a side chick and that she called his wife, which hurt his marriage. T-G-I-F. They were having fun. He was married and she tried to ruin his house. No, baby boy. No, 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 no. Serving up Friday night tea. A single woman can't ruin a married man's house. Candy ain't take no vows with that lady. He did. Candy didn't mess your marriage up. On Fox Soul. You messed your marriage up. Show. Welcome back to the Tammy Mac Late Show on Fox Soul. We're about to wrap up, but we cannot wrap up without talking about the United Negro College Fund. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. It makes me think of Lou Rawls all the time. You'll never find, because Lou Rawls <laughs> used to do those UNCF fundraisers every single year. So uh, the next story comes as a surprise to me and everybody black. I'm sure it was for the rest of you too. Uh, the United Negro College Fund elected Milton C. Jones as its first ever African-American chair of the board of directors. Yes, I'm silent too. <laughs> yes, we're, we're, we're just happy that Milton gets to unite the Negroes. Thank you, Milton. <laughs> you got the job. <laughs> Thank you, Milton. You even got a name that means you're not the Negro. Milton. You know, Milton. you don't just get named Milton for nothing. So that everybody means you're going to do Uncle great Milton. things. Everybody Uncle has Uncle Milty. <laughs> Uncle Milty, you're not the Negroes. Thank you, Uncle, Uncle Milty. I just, I didn't realize that we hadn't had one already, but, you know, hey, you know, we were better late than never. Thank you, Uncle Milty. Really? Really? Better late than never? <laughs> 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 Everybody who was giving Lou Rawls that money at the UNCF was paying uh, these white men all this time. <laughs> Your money wasn't going to the Negroes at all. <laughs> well, at least the scholarships are going to Black people. And it's interesting that this is happening during a time of reckoning because of Black Lives Matter and the anti-racist movement that Fortune 500 companies are being forced to look at their boards, and most of them have zero Black people. Even now, months after they all pledge to make change due to the Black Lives Movement. And so it's interesting that this is also coming home to roost at the United Negro College Fund. Hopefully we'll see change, not just in the Black organizations, but across the board on these boards. It. You know, I, it's 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 interesting. I mean, you, you think about the UNCF and I think through the years, they, they say that they've raised over five billion dollars, um, you know, supported over 500,000 uh, students uh, with scholarships. Um, and that's important work. Right. I, no matter who's been the chair of the board, you can't get the lose sight of, of that impact on on educating African-Americans in the country. Um, it is a surprise that the chair of the board hasn't been African-American, but you know, I look at it the other way, you know, I'm, you know, all this time we've been sort of talking about, you know, we need to do it ourselves and, 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 you know, we might have to go it alone. But what that tells me is that, you know, there are good people across the board and, and dedicated to uh, the work of helping, you know, strengthen our community and, and we don't have to do it alone and we can establish those relationships that, that help us out. But again, a real surprise that this is the first board chair. Dr. Oleka, I guess we'll wrap with you tonight. Well, I think Ed is right on this. Uh, and a lot of this goes back to power and wealth. I mean, when the uh, United Negro College Fund was founded, a whole lot of black folks didn't have a ton of wealth. So if you're gonna be on the board, you gotta give money. That's where a lot of it can come from. But I think Dominique is right on this too. I think as we look at this idea of reckoning, of focusing on race and opportunity, we also have to look at ourselves, our own black organizations to make sure that even they are diversified with black leadership. But again, with this conversation and with all of us together coming from different political spectrums, I'm hopeful. I think that if we can be the type of future that we want in this country, and if we can influence our own circles, that our country can be better off. And we're looking forward to a much better country. Thank you so much all for being on the Tammy McLeod Show tonight. Ed, Alicia, Dr. Oleka, and Dominique, I will see you next Friday. And until then, everybody, I mean, I'll see you our viewers on Monday. Okay. I'm gonna see them next Friday until Monday though. It's a blessing to be in your box on the Tammy Mac late show on Fox. So bye y'all have a great weekend. <laughs>